You're listening to the REI Marketing Nerds Podcast, the leading resource for real estate investors who want to dominate their market online. Dan Barrett is the founder of AdWords Nerds, a high-tech digital agency focusing exclusively on helping real estate investors like you get more leads and deals online, outsmart your competition, and live a freer, more awesome life. And now, your host, Dan Barrett. Hey guys, welcome back. You're listening to the second part of last week's episode. Let's jump back in. I want to ask you about, you know, I I loved what you said about, um, you know, I certainly think it's true that like a lot of people made money in this past market. I don't want to say by luck, but the wind was at their back. It was relatively easy to make money. And so what you're looking for is how do you react to mistakes, right? And what what is your track record of recovering, right? I really like that. I've never really thought about that before, but I think that's such an incredible filter to pass sort of potential partners or even potential employees through, right? I mean, that's that's a really powerful filter. Going back to the beginning of your story, right? You, you I can imagine this sort of situation where you put the the ad in the you know, the back of a newspaper or whatever. You get all these people coming in, you raise all this money, and then, like you said, you bought a disaster. Right. And so I can imagine a lot of people at that point would have been like, well, that didn't work. You know what I mean? Like that would have been it. But you, like you said, you revised the process. Like you said, you figured out your box of what you wanted to buy in and then you kept moving forward. So how do you think about recovering from mistakes and sort of develop? I mean, it strikes me as that's almost a skill that you develop over time. Right. So how do you think about that? I mean, clearly, like you're you're very successful today, but we all run into these obstacles and have these problems all the time. So how do you think about recovering from when things don't go according to plan? Well, that's a huge question. So, you know, I put that $45 ad in the newspaper and over the next 30 months, I bought 4,000 apartments. I raised $18 million, bought $60 million worth of apartments in five U.S. markets and vertically integrated a property management company. I I built a company worth a hundred million dollars. And, you know, 2008 roared its ugly head and wiped out, you know, a lot of people. By 2009, we had made, you know, uh, some serious mistakes. And and I always tell people, I say, I, I made five mistakes. I grew too fast as a company. I was undercapitalized for the growth that I had as a company. I was over leveraged. I had $60 million worth of real estate at 85% loan to value. I always say, I don't know who was worth me, worse me for taking the money or the banks for giving it to me. Because today I would tell anybody, do not get in a deal unless you're 65 to 70% loan to value. And I didn't listen to people around me or pay attention to the details. And as a result of that, I imploded. I tried to save my company. We had occupancy grew, our net operating income crashed. We couldn't pay our bills. We couldn't pay our investors. I tried to save my company when I had, you know, I had 38 different companies. I had probably 12 of them. I should have let go to foreclosure, uh, let some investors get hurt, but I didn't want anybody to get hurt. I thought it was a recession. It had last 17 or 18 months. There'd be a 10, 12% correction in the market. That's your typical recession. Well, this thing lasted seven or eight years with a 40% correction. It was hard to mitigate that storm. Yeah. So I I tried to move money between companies. So I would take money from profitable companies, put it in non-profitable companies. My attorney, my accountant both said it was okay to do that. Just leave a paper trail. So that was fine. But here's the problem in real estate. As a licensed person, as a individual where you take money from somebody, you're held at a much higher standard and your transparency needs to be greater. So I wasn't very transparent with my investors. And as a result of that, I wound up being charged on wire fraud and mail fraud charges and got sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. So I got wiped out, lost everything, including my family. Now, to answer your, your, how do you come back? How do you, your resilience question? I kind yeah. of picked up, you were asking about resilience. Well, I thought my life was over. I, I found myself in federal prison in 2013, wondering, you know, 
man, things can't get any worse than this. And then my wife decided to divorce me. And, uh, you know, the joke in prison was take his shoelaces because we think he's going to hurt himself. Right. And so I was probably in prison about six weeks. I walk into the gym one day and, you know, and, and what I like people to know is I never flew private. I didn't have a fancy house. I didn't buy a fancy car. I was a neighborhood baseball coach, home every night for dinner. I loved what I did. And I, I just got caught in a bad place. I wound up getting ripped from that lifestyle I was living to live in a 12 by 12 room with three men I didn't know, nor did I like. Wonder what the hell happened. And I, I walk into gym one day about six weeks into prison and this guy walks over to me and he goes, hey, don't let these people beat you. All they want to do is take from you everything you've ever known. They can take your money. They can take your business. They can turn your family inside out, but they can't take who you are and what you're made of. They can't take what caused you to build that business or what you have inside. And I don't know, we all have these defining moments in our life. And this was one for me, the switch flipped. And I went, holy cow. And from that moment, I started to go to this class. I started working out. I started losing weight, feeling better. You know, I went to prison. I was 35 pounds overweight and hated myself. I had gone from running marathons to a new lifestyle. Yeah. And, uh, so I started working out, started feeling better. Wound up going to college. I got a bachelor's degree in theology. Wrote two books, Exit Plan, and I wrote a second book on property management, which I'm just finishing up to release here in the next couple months. I wrote an ethics course. I taught real estate investing, property management, and ethics in prison for six years. Was on an outreach program, went into the community. I told my story to small business owners and local college students. Met a professor from the University of Minnesota, and he and I co-authored a paper together that we had published in the Business Journal of Ethics that gets taught at the collegiate level today for forensic accounting and sales and marketing classes. I'm home today. I'm in the coaching and training business. I love to uh, speak publicly, tell my story. And uh, I recently, you know, last year, I should say, I got approved by the SEC to go back, sponsor uh, these apartment deals again, be an issuer of securities and raise capital. So the only reason I'm where I'm at today, and I'm very grateful for that, is is that I took the initiative. I think a lot of times people give up or held back because they're trapped in their mind. There's something that imprisons them. You know, I might have been behind a wall, but so many people are in a prison of their mind. You know, I can't. I'm a failure. I'm afraid of failing addictions, you know, drugs, alcohol, sex, past abuse, any one of those things can keep somebody from moving forward. Yeah. You just have to make, make the choice to not let your past define your future and move forward. And that's, that's my message really is what I want people to understand is there's life beyond what happened. Yeah. I, I mean, that is such an incredible story. I just want to first of all, say thank you for sharing that. It's a really vulnerable thing to talk about. And the, the fact that you are able to talk about it so openly and so freely and, and kind of turn that into an inspirational message it is absolutely blows my mind. Like I, I am so impressed by that. So I want, I want to say thank you for that. Sure. Want to find motivated seller leads online, but don't know where to start? Download our free Motivated Seller Keyword Report today. AdWords nerds have spent over $5 million this year researching the most profitable keywords for finding motivated seller leads. And you can grab these exact keywords when you download our report at www.adwordsnerds.com slash keywords. I've got two questions that, that, that kind of strike me. But first, I want to ask, so you, you just said you you're recently approved by the SEC again, uh, or SEC to, to get into, to start doing the sponsorships, right? And, and start, basically, that feels to me like a full circle moment. And I'm, I'm very curious how it felt to you in that moment, because I imagine, you know, it's almost like, you know, the chapter kind of starts in many ways, or, you know, with, with this 
terrible series of events that occur and, and all these things you have to go through. And then you kind of come out the other end of it. And now you're, I don't know, given this kind of official seal of approval. And I'm curious how that felt to you, if that meant a lot, or if you just felt like, no, all the work I did before is what meant something to me. I, I don't, what, what did that, what was that like? Yeah, it was huge. Um, thanks for asking that. That's a great question. And, and really it, you know, honestly, the story starts with the success I had. I built a hundred million dollar company in 30 months. I was a little, I, uh, I was a little out of whack in my head. My ego was big. I was prideful. I thought I had the world by the short hairs and, you know, I crashed and burned oh. and could have just gone to prison and laid in bed all day and ate and watched TV and did nothing, but made decisions to, to re-engineer myself. I came home in the best shape of my life, spiritually, physically, mentally, and emotionally, ready to conquer the world. And um, it wasn't an easy start. So I partnered with two of my coaching clients on, on a, you know, a, a moderate size 40 unit apartment deal in Florida. And we have an attorney, a securities attorney we're, we're talking to about my situation. And, and she says, uh, you know, I think I can get you approved by the SEC to, you know, be able to do this. And I was like, well, have at it. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was a little doubtful about, about that whole approach. And, uh, you know, we didn't talk about it again for three months. And she came back to a call one day where she goes, oh, by the way, let me show you this. And had this, this letter from the SEC. And uh, uh, they said, you know, that because of what I had learned and how I'd grown, that, uh, you know, that they were, you know, and, and the time that had lapsed, that, you know, the grace would be good. So, um, you know, the feeling was like surprise. I was shocked. I, you know, I was elated. My partners were elated. They yeah. couldn't believe it. SEC said, yeah, and you only need to disclose it for well, at the time, which would have been five months. And I said, well, just let them know that I will always disclose it because I never want that to come back and haunt me or somebody to say, hey, you never told me this or. Right. Yeah. So I always disclose it. That's why I'm so transparent about it. Yeah. I think it in a strange way, right? The fact that you are not afraid of talking about something like this, right? They're talking about this, like I said, it's a really vulnerable moment. It really builds a sense of trust with you very quickly, right? Because it's like, oh, okay, well, you're, you know, you're clearly not hiding this thing away from me. And transparency is such a core part of who you are. I mean, it comes across in how you talk about multifamily and how you talk about, you know, the teaching people. And I just find that so amazing. I have a, maybe a random question, but I'm really curious to kind of go back to this period where you're rebuilding yourself, you know, you're getting in shape, you know, you're in prison. It's this, this really dark moment. Why theology? Like was theology something that you were interested in before? Is that something you found in that process? Like what drew you to study that versus anything else? That's a great question. I, so, you know, there's a whole story behind this. I've been a Christian since 1983. I always tell people I was a pocket Christian, pulled God out of my pocket when I was in a jam and <laughs> um, put him back as soon as it was over. Right. And uh, so I'm in prison and, um, you know, I, I, I don't know if I was leaning into God or leaning away from him and, and mad, you know, but I, I wrote to five colleges and I wrote to five Christian colleges, Liberty, Trinity, Adams and Wheaton here in Illinois. And um, uh, I wrote to those four colleges and within 30 days, and, and I needed two things, Dan, to go to school and get a bachelor's degree. And I needed a correspondence course and I needed a scholarship. So I needed them to pay for it and be able to, I, there were no computer access, no internet access. So I couldn't do anything online. So either two of the schools didn't have correspondence and two of the schools didn't have scholarship, but they had, you know, one had scholarships, one didn't have correspondent. Right. So, so I was feeling kind of, you know, like what defeated a little bit about it. And a guy said to me, he goes, Hey, look, there's a small Bible college in Iowa. You can write to them. They'll respond to you. I kid you not. I wrote to them in May of 2014. 
the exact day in May of 2015, I got a letter back in the mail said, we have a correspondence course and we'll, you, you've been awarded a, a full ride scholarship. Wow. So I, you know, and cause I wanted to, you know, get my degree in, in theology because I knew if I leaned into Christ the whole time I was gone, that it would help my ride. Yeah. And, and it was tough. It was a tough walk. You see things, you hear things, you experience things in prison that the average person doesn't or shouldn't ever in their life. And I knew that for me, the only way that I was going to get through it was to pull God out of my pocket. I think part of that was too, that he wanted to have my full undivided attention. So he ripped my cold, dead fingers one at a time off of everything I held dearly um, in my life. I mean, that is such a cool story, man. That's a fascinating story. I mean, I, I think it just, it says a lot about you, right? That you were willing to put yourself in that situation where, you know, you're, you're putting yourself in a situation where you have to pull through, right? And you have to do the work. Um, because it's not exactly, you know, the thing that it reminds me of, I mean, it's a strange, I've got an eight-year-old right? He's in elementary school. He has trouble studying if it's too noisy, right? He has trouble doing homework. You are literally pursuing a higher education in like the most, you know, inopportune possible time and environment. I find that really inspirational. So let's, let's talk about today. Cause obviously, I mean, your, your, your story is inspirational, but, but I think what, what really makes you special is this kind of bringing all that stuff to what you do today and the students that you work with, right? So I want you to take a moment and tell people if they are interested in getting into multifamily, right? If I'm an investor, I'm willing to get started. And we've talked about syndication, right? We've talked about sponsorship and stuff. Let's say I want to do it, right? I want to be the one. Obviously, they can come and work with you. When you see investors getting into multifamily for the first time, right? And you've had this experience of walking people through this process many times now. What are the mistakes that they tend to make that hold them back? Right. right. Like what are the things that people do when they start to approach the multifamily space where either they're bringing over a, a mental model that doesn't apply or they just think about it in the wrong way? Where do investors tend to go wrong? They don't take action, I think is the biggest mistake. I remember one time being in an event and I sat down on a bench next to a guy who had these two big shopping bags full of books and tapes. And I said to him, I go, uh, uh, you know, boy, he looks like uh, you're going to really get get study. And he goes, yeah, I have so much of this stuff at home. I don't know how I'm going to go home and explain to my wife I spent another $5,000. And, he, I, he, you know, it was clear to me that he was a overeducated guy that just couldn't take action. And I think so many people are held back by either fear, fear of lack of money, fear of not of not succeeding. And we have to take action. So I think coaching, I've had a coach in my life for 20 years. Coaching is really important in people's lives because no matter how much you know, it's the accountability. Who are you accountable to? And uh, what what I do with, with some of my coaching pe- clients is I teach them something. We work on something on a call and then I give them an assignment and you have to come back the next week and be held accountable. It's just like when I was coached in the real estate business, my coach would teach me how to prospect. Now go make 20 calls or 200 calls, whatever it is. And if I didn't come back and have that accomplished, I I didn't feel like I succeeded. So I think there's seven easy steps in in multifamily and it's, you know, what are your goals, your whys, your dreams, relationships, locating deals, underwriting deals, doing the due diligence, understanding the markets and operations. And, you know, it's it's a pretty easy progression, but how do you do it? And do you take the action to do it? All right. So I want, if you are listening to this, look, we're just talking about taking action. Obviously you should go over to mycoreintentions.com slash free. Mike is giving away a free copy of Exit Plan, his book to people who are listening to this. So you go to mycoreintentions.com slash free. You can get it for free. There's obviously no reason not to do that. Mike, I want to say thank you so much for coming on this show and sharing your story. It really is an incredible one. For people that want to follow up with you, we've talked about myincoreintentions.com. Do you do social media or anything, or or is that just the best place to go and check out what you're doing? No, I'm all over social media. So, you know, no matter where you're at, Mike Morowski or My Core Intentions on any platform, you'll find me. 
um, even Twitter <laughs> or on the, uh, uh, TikTok is what I meant. All right. Well, Twitter, yeah. Twitter's my personal fave, so I will definitely be following you on there. But Mike Morowski from MyCoreIntentions.com, thank you so much for doing this, man. I, I really, really appreciate it. You bet. Thanks, Dan, for having me. I appreciate it. That is it. That's it for our interview this week. Look, I hope you enjoyed it. Mike was incredibly vulnerable and I think really, really brave in coming on the show to share his story. I hope you got a ton out of it. I know I did. Hey, you know that every single episode we put show notes up over at AdwordsNerds.com. You can go over there, click the word podcast up at the top menu, and you will see all our past episodes. Go check them out. If you've just started listening, go check out a bunch of our past episodes. I've been doing this a long time now. I got a bunch of them. If you know someone, you like someone in real estate, they've probably been on the show in the past. If not, let me know. I'll have them on in the future. Look, I just want to say thank you so much for listening. It really means a lot to me. I will be seeing you next week. Cheers, everybody. This is the podcastfactory.com. Thank <laughs> you.